As you watch this teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see. Welcome to my program. My friend, my name is Rick Renner, and what an honor that you would let me come right into your space. Please try to join me here every day as we dive into the Word of God. This week, I'm teaching a brand new series called Keeping Your Thinking Straight. The subtitle says, Biblical Guidelines for Thinking Straight in a World All Messed Up. And in the previous two programs, I've discussed eliminating wrong thinking and learning to think right and what you have to do to adapt the thinking of God. And today, we're going to talk about keeping your thinking straight about religion and about prejudice in the church. Today and tomorrow is really going to be powerful. Don't miss one minute of today or tomorrow. But please order this whole series, and you can order it by going online or by giving us a call. And it comes with a study guide that you can read while you're watching it or while you're seeing it. This is teaching you really need to get down deep inside you. We need to keep our thinking straight. And that's why I'm also offering you my book, which is called how to keep your head on straight in a world gone crazy. If you feel like everybody around you has gone crazy, or when you watch the news, you think, ay, 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 what are people thinking? Well, they're not thinking. They're so open-minded, their brains have fallen out. My friends, God gave us brains because we need them, and God gave us a sound mind. And we need to know how to keep our head on straight in a world that has gone crazy, just because everybody else seems to have gone berserk does not mean we have to go crazy. We can keep our head on straight. And the subtitle says, Developing Discernment for These Last Days. This really is a book that you will devour. It's endorsed by 31 Christian leaders, and the foreword is written by my friend John Bevere. My friends, please get this, and you ought to order two or three, because this is definitely a book that you're going to want to share with someone. When you read the first three chapters, you're going to say, ay, 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 because we really nail several issues about where we need to keep our head on straight in a world gone crazy. It will help you. And when you become a partner with our ministry, we'll send you two books as our way of saying, welcome to the family, a family of partners together with me and Denise and our ministry. We, with our partners, are touching people around the planet, literally around the planet. People are tuning in to hear this teaching of the Bible. Proverbs 10, 21 says, the lips of the righteous feed many. I know that's my assignment, but I can only do it because of partners. Our partners, through their financial giving, regularly put fuel in the tank, which enables us to bring this teaching to you and to people just like you all over the world. And without ever getting out of your chair by going online or by giving us a call, you can become a partner and make a difference in someone else's life. And the moment you do, we're going to send you my book called Life in the Combat Zone, which is dedicated to our partners, and Denise's book called The Gift of Forgiveness. But today, we're going to be talking about keeping our thinking straight about religion. But please remember that if you need prayer, we want to pray for you. So give us a call or send us your email. The moment we hear from you, we're going to begin to release our faith for you. But I'll be back in just a moment. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. I am so glad you've let me come into your space, and today we're going to talk about keeping our thinking straight about religion. You say, religion? Rick, are you really going to teach on religion? I am, because it's in James chapter 1. We need to understand what is good religion, what is bad religion, what is pure religion, what is impure religion. James talks about religion in James chapter 1 and verse 26. So let's go there. And in James chapter 1, I've got my Bible. I hope you have yours. We're believing for a revival of the Bible in the church. But in James 1, 26, James writes these words. If a man among you seem to be religious, there's that word religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. What does that mean? Well, you're going to find out in just a moment. Verse 27. 
pure religion. Pure? That means there can be impure religion, but here he's talking about pure religion. An undefiled, that means there can be defiled religion. But here he's talking about undefiled religion, pure religion, and undefiled before God. And the Father is this. Here it is. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. These verses are so powerful and we need to really keep our thinking straight about what James chapter 1 says about pure and impure religion. Let's look at it again. James 1 26, if any man among you seem to be religious. Well, first of all, in Greek, the word man is not included. It means if anyone, it throws open the door to anyone who seems to be religious. And the word seem is the Greek word dokeia, which means to give oneself a self-appraisal, to judge himself. And people have all kinds of ideas about what it means to be religious. Some are, some are not, but they think that they are. And that's what James now says in this verse. If any man seems to be, thinks himself to be religious, and the word religious, the Greek word threskos, which really describes one that pays a lot of attention to outward duties in religion, outward duties, outward services. He's going through the motions and it appears to himself and to others, wow, this is really a pious individual. But he goes on to say, if any man among you seem, doesn't mean that he is, but he seems to be, he thinks himself to be, other people think that he is religious and bridleth not his tongue. The word bridleth is the very word used to describe the bridle that you put in the horse, the horse's mouth. And with that bridle, you can constrain a horse, you can lead a horse, you can guide a horse, you can hold a horse in check. And in this particular verse, it means to constrain, to hold in check. So James says, if a person seems to be, claims to be, purports to be religious, but he's not able to constrain his tongue. He can't hold his tongue in check, which means he's wagging his tongue all the time, talking about others and saying things that he should not do. He says, this man deceives his own heart. And the word deceive that is used here means to seduce or to give oneself a distorted perception. He just has a wrong view of himself, a distorted view, thinking that he is religious because he goes through motions and is observant of outward activities. But James says this man has deceived his heart. It doesn't matter how many candles he burns, how many times he crosses himself, how many times he goes to church, or how many times he raises his hands in worship. It doesn't matter what your emotions are. If you're not able to hold your tongue in check and to constrain your tongue, then you deceive your own heart. This word deceive, to seduce you can seduce yourself into believing something that's not true about you, to give yourself a false impression. And the Bible says he deceives his own heart. The Greek says the heart of him. And the word heart is the Greek word cardia. It's where you get the word for a cardiac ward or a cardiac arrest. It's the word for the heart. This is an issue of the heart. Deception is of the heart. And this person is really deceived to their core. They think they are religious because of outward observant things that they do. But James says, hey, this man's religion, again, the word religion, the Greek word threskos, his outward motions, his outward activities, all the observant outward things that he does that makes him appear or seem to be so religion. He says, this man's religion is vain. The word vain, the Greek word matthios, ay, ay, ay. The word matthias means it's vain, it's a waste, it's empty, it's futile, it is hollow. And my friends, I'm going to tell you, this is really what causes the world to say that we're all a bunch of hypocrites because we say one thing and we do something else. Let me give you an example. When I was a young boy, we went to our church every week. I loved our church, but we had one woman in our church who seemed to be so spiritual. She seemed to be. And when she would stand in church, she would give her testimony and she would cry and cry. And 
the woman who had the box of Kleenex would bring her a box of Kleenex and she would wipe her tears as she testified about, oh, I love this church and this church has meant so much to me. And she would go on and on and on and on and on. And you know what? It never impressed me because I saw what she did after church. Very often that woman who was a leader in our church would come to our home. And I loved her and dreaded her presence in our home at the same time because of what she did. I really loved her because she was fun, but her mouth was horrible. She would plop herself on the couch, lean on the arm of the couch and say, well, what kind of new gossip do you have? I'm talking right after she left church where she stood and said, how I love this church. When she got to our house and plopped down on the couch, she would run her mouth So I've heard this and I've heard this and I've heard this and I've heard this. It was like garbage coming out of her mouth. And I remember as a young boy looking at her thinking, how is it possible that she nearly emptied a box of Kleenex in church crying about how much she loved this church and as soon as church is over, she's plopped on our couch in our living room talking about everybody in the church. It was wrong. Her religion was vain. It was vain. It was futile. It was hollow. It was impure before God. That's what James says. And then when you come to James 1, 27, he adds, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. Mm, This is so powerful because most people think that real religious activity is being observant of services and going through religious duties. And James says, no, 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 no. That's not what impresses God. It's taking care of people, taking care of people. That is pure religion. That's what really is near to the heart of God. In fact, when it says pure religion, it's a compound of two Greek words, the Greek word threskos and the word katharos, the word threskos means religious, devout, pious, outward, good acts, connected to the Greek word kathar or katharos, which is a Greek word which describes something that is cleansed, something that is pure, something that is free of undesirable toxins, unclean elements, and compounded together. These two words paint a picture of religion that is clean, religion that is pure, Religion that is free of undesirable toxins or any other form of uncleanness, or you could even translate it clean religion. There's clean religion and there's dirty religion. And dirty religion is what gives the rest of us a bad name. When people say one thing and act another way, this is dirty religion in the sight of God. And now James is addressing us and he's saying, keep your thinking straight about what is impressive religion before God. It's not just what you say. God's looking at what you say and what you do. You have to have accompanying actions. And he says, pure religion and undefiled. The word undefiled in Greek means unpolluted. That means there can be polluted religion. Unspotted. That means there can be spotted religion. Unstained. Free from contamination. Religion that is free from contamination before God. Now look at those words. Before God in Greek, it says para totheo. The word para means alongside of, totheo, alongside of God. But it really means near to God or near to the heart of God. Religious activities, religious services, religious actions that really are near to the heart of God and really touches the heart of God and is impressive to God. It's not just running your mouth and saying the right words and then behaving badly. God's looking for actions, pure religion, pure religion, religion that is pure and undefiled before God. The Greek literally means alongside of God, near to the heart of God that really touches the heart of God. And my friend, I know that you want to touch the heart of God. Well, what is it? Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father. First of all, we come to the words, the Father. In Greek, the word pater. The word father describes a loving father with all the caring attributes of fatherhood who loves his children and he loves those that are in need. And if you want to touch the father heart of God, then you have to do what touches his heart. This is pure religion. What is it? It is this, he says, 
to visit, to visit the fatherless. The word visit is the Greek word episkeptomai. It's very interesting. The word epi means over. Skeptoskopos is the Greek word which means to look. It's where you get the word for a telescope or a microscope. It means to really focus on something. But when you compound the two words together and they become the word episkeptomai, it doesn't just mean to wave at the needy from a distance. It doesn't mean just to see them over there and recognize they have a need. But this word visit means to look upon, to physically pay them a visit, to inspect their condition, to provide help for those who are in need. And it was even used to denote providing medical care to those who could not pay for it by themselves. That is what this word visit means. Isn't that amazing? It's not enough just to see the needy from a distance and just wave at them. We're called by God to go to them, to inspect their condition, to see what we can do to help them, what we can do to provide medical care for them. And I'll tell you that in our own ministry, we have a very large part of our ministry that we don't talk about very often, but it is indeed this very thing. It's caring for the homeless, providing clothes for people that do not have clothes, feeding people that do not have food to eat, taking care of those that are in drug rehabilitation centers. We don't talk about it a lot, but we do it very regularly and we do a lot of it. Why? Because this is very near to the heart of God and the people that you help can't pay you back, but God does. God does. And this is near to the heart of God. And when you touch God's heart, God responds. And the verse goes on to say to visit the fatherless. What does that mean fatherless? Well, it is the Greek word orphanos, and I'm sure you hear another word. It's where we get the word for orphans. And of course, an orphan is one that does not have a parent, but not necessarily orphans in the truest sense of the world. These could be social orphans. What do I mean by a social orphan? Well, maybe they have a father and mother, but their father and mother are irresponsible, and the child has been abandoned. Even though technically they have parents, They've been abandoned. They are orphans. In Russia, we call them social orphans. And we have a very large outreach in our own ministry and our own church to social orphans in the city of Moscow because even though they have parents, their parents are irresponsible and the kids have no clothes to wear. They have nowhere to live. They have no food to eat. And God is touched when we do something for these people. And it doesn't necessarily just describe children. It could describe anyone that is abandoned. Maybe it is a spouse that's been abandoned. This Greek word orphanos carries the idea of abandonment. And when you and I know that someone is suffering abandonment, abandoned by a spouse, abandoned by their family, abandoned by their friends, and they're living in isolation and they feel so alone, we have a God-given responsibility to visit them, to inspect their needs, and to see what we can do to help them in their situation. And in fact, James then goes on and says, we are also to visit the widows. Well, you don't hear a lot of talk about widows today. When I was a young boy, we had a lot of talk about widows. But today people don't use that word very often because widows don't seem to suffer the same financial need that they did many, many years ago because of governmental programs. But there really are widows indeed. Widows who have no help. They have no financial supplement to help them. And they really are suffering. And that's why this verse goes on to say widows in their affliction. That word affliction is the Greek word thalipsis. That word thalipsis describes somebody that is under great pressure. They feel they're being suffocated. They're having a hard time getting by in life. They wake up every day struggling, not knowing how they're going to make it through the day. They don't have money. And even if they have financial help from the government, nonetheless, they're in affliction. They're widows. The word widow is the Greek word kata. It describes a widow in the traditional sense of the word, the very word that Jesus used in Matthew 23, verse 14, and Luke chapter 4, verse 26, to describe widows. And my friends, when a person becomes a widow, they really are in a very difficult plight. They may not know how to pay their bills. If they have a yard, who's going to mow their yard? If they have a problem with their roof or their hot water tank, who are they going to call? They really are in a very difficult position. Socially, they're in a difficult position. Financially, they feel isolated. 
And now even when they come to church, they come by themselves. They used to come with their spouse. Now they feel out of place. They don't know how to carry on in this new life without their spouse. They're widows in a state of affliction, trying to figure out how they're going to make it through every single new day. And James says, if you're really religious, if your religious activities are really impressive to the heart of God, then you're going to be a person that is taking care of those that are abandoned and the widows in their affliction. That is exactly what this means. So we find out that according to James chapter 1, verse 27, we as believers have a God-given responsibility to reach out and to help widowed women who are struggling due to the loss of their spouse. If it is good and clean and acceptable religion before God, it means we're visiting and we're assisting those that feel they have been abandoned and they don't know what to do. Our religion reaches beyond ourselves. It's not just in our mouth. It's also in our actions. Burning candles, crossing yourself, raising your hands in a charismatic service. All of that's fine. That's meaningful to you. That's fine. But if that's all that you're doing, hmm, that's not very serious religion. And not only that, if you're saying all the right words, you've got all the Christian lingo, but your mouth is filled with gossip, my friends, the Bible says your religion is vain, and not only vain, it's dirty. This is dirty religion. But wait, then James goes on, and in James chapter 2, verse 1, he remarkably then adds, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. What does that mean with respect of persons? The Greek word means to judge somebody by their exterior or by their face. And then he begins an entire chapter on prejudice in the church, judging people by their skin color, judging people by their education or lack of education, judging people by their nationality, judging people by their economic status, judging them by their outward appearance. You know, one day Denise and I were attending an art auction in Moscow just for fun. And there was a man sitting not far from me. And I kept thinking to myself, oh, this poor homeless man, how in the world did he wander into this art auction? Denise and I were not buying. We were just there to watch. Well, as the auction continued, this man that I thought was so poor and homeless raised his hand and bought a painting for a million dollars. <laughs> this man had more money than anybody in the room. But outwardly, I thought he was just a homeless person who had nothing. We need to be careful that we don't make conclusions about people just on their outward exterior appearance. And that's what James addresses in the next chapter where he tells us we need to keep our thinking straight about prejudice in the church. And that's where we're going to begin when we come back tomorrow. I'll be back in just a moment and I'm going to pray for you. Is your thinking right or wrong? If you figured out that some of your thinking is wrong, how do you fix it and start thinking healthy and right thoughts? What goes on inside your head determines what goes on in your life. So keeping your thinking straight is really important. In this five-part series, Keeping Your Thinking Straight, Rick Renner will teach you five steps to change your thinking. Thinking straight about religion. Thinking straight about prejudice in the church. Thinking straight about economic status and money. Available in digital and physical formats starting at just $10. You'll learn how to identify wrong thinking and start thinking healthy, powerful, and life-changing thoughts. In addition, we are also offering you Rick's book, How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy. In this book, you'll discover what Christians need to be doing to stay out of the chaos and remain anchored to truth. You'll also learn how to stay sensitive to the Holy Spirit, to discern right and wrong teaching, to be grounded in prayer, and to be spiritually prepared for living in victory in these last days. Let Rick take you deep into New Testament prophecies about the end of the age and about what you need to do to sail successfully through turbulent end-time waters. This powerful and eye-opening book can be yours for just $20. Don't miss this special offer, this series, Keeping Your Thinking Straight, and the book, How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now.
friends, this is Rick Renner. I want to give you a good report. It is amazing, but we just signed the papers to purchase our new building in Tulsa, a new headquarters for our ministry. We've been in the same location for years and years and years, and we've outgrown it. And because so many people are reaching out to us for more teaching and for prayer and for ministry, we need more space so we can effectively minister to them. And at the same time, we're constructing our studio in Moscow, where we're going to be filming the most wonderful Bible teaching programs that touch people all over the world. But the only reason we're able to do all of this at one time is because of people like you that are members of our giving team. And because of your gifts, we're able to do this in Tulsa, we're able to do this in Moscow. And my friends, I want to remind you that it's not about the buildings. No, 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 it's about people that need to be touched. We just need space so that we can minister to them. And I want to say thank you so much for being a part of the giving team and remaining a part of the giving team as we get the buildings ready and put up walls and get ready to produce programming and to minister to people all over the face of the planet. And if you're not a partner and a member of our giving team yet, please become a part of our team today. I wanna say thanks for letting me be with you today. It means so much to me that you let me come into your space. And I would love to know your thoughts about what I taught today about pure religion and dirty religion. Would you please respond and let me know how this program impacted you today? And I'm teaching a whole series, which is called Keeping Your Thinking Straight. And tomorrow, we're going to see about keeping our thinking straight about prejudice in the church. These are very important issues and very dear to the heart of God. We need to know what God thinks, and we need to keep our thinking straight on all these issues and many more. And that's why the subtitle says, Biblical Guidelines for Thinking Straight in a World All Messed Up. And it comes with a study guide. And remember that we're offering you right now my book, which is called How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy. The subtitle says, Developing Discernment for these last days. My friends, we're living in the last days and we need discernment so we can keep our heads straight in a world gone crazy. But let me pray for you. Father, thank you. Lord, help each of us to really review our life to see if our religion is pure or if our religion is dirty. Help us to do those things that are near to your heart. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll see you tomorrow. But remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there's power. Thank you for watching this broadcast. For more information on product resources or to learn how you can partner with this ministry, please connect with us at renner.org. Also, please be sure to visit us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you enjoyed that teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.